and why, why we should read Ross. We should really given the context. Uh, so I started off writing it for an audience who had largely not heard of Ross and weren't familiar with the basic ideas. Um, but then she told me that actually there's quite a few people from the English speaking world who joined in. Uh, and so perhaps that, that gave me a bit more license to say a few other things. Um, I, I think the, probably the end result is a bit of a mishmash. <laughs> but there should be something to uh, talk about for everybody. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, like uh, many French people currently, I suspect, is that when, when I went to university, I wasn't taught Ross. Uh, I mean, this was in the 80s, and it was probably a low point or the end of a low point for ethical intuitionism. Um, and I just, I didn't know who he was, what he thought. Um, and just as a bit of a background information, uh, my first permanent job was at Keel University with Jonathan Dancy and David McNaughton and Eve Garrard. And so I thought I'd better look up about these people. And they all seem to, they're all moral realists and what's worse, they were this old fashioned sort of moral realism that I thought was dead and buried insofar as I understood anything about it, is ethical intuitionism. Uh, so I arrived up there, but I thought I'd better kind of at least be able to talk to these people. So I thought I'd better read Ross. Um, and I read Ross, Ross is the right and the good, uh, and became a born again intuitionist. I just thought, uh, I was utterly convinced by every part of it, pretty much. And emailed my teachers at Essex, uh, uh, and my supervisor, Nora O'Neill, who persuaded me that camp was the best I could do in ethics, saying, now I've read Ross and now everything's clear. Uh, I'm no longer a Kantian, I'm a Rossian. And that was around about sort of mid to early 90s. Uh, and so that, that, that appointment and trying to go native as much as I could had a profound philosophical impact on me. Uh, I'm not hoping for anything like that today for the rest of you, but uh, try to give you a taste of why one might be so impressed with Ross today. So let me get a, I've got some PowerPoint slides. They're not very sophisticated, but they'll just help guide, guide us through the talk. Uh, right, here we go. Okay, so um, for those of you who uh, haven't heard of Ross's views before, he's, he's one, uh, one of the, the last of the classic intuitionists. Ethical intuitionism is a, move, a philosophical movement uh, in British moral philosophy mainly that lasted from the sort of early 18th century through to Ross in the 1930s. Uh, there were intuitionists after Ross, like A.C. Ewing, who wrote in the 40s and 50s, but really it peaked, I think Ross and Pritchard in the first third of the century of the 20th century is where the, where the doctrine peaked, at least in its first wave. Uh, and as an intuitionist, there's three kind of key elements to uh, Ross's thought. The first is, and this is the one that most people think of when they think of ethical intuitionism, is an, a distinctive epistemology. It's a foundationalist epistemology, according to which you know, you've learned, you can know various derivative moral propositions by knowing the premises that support them. Uh, and ultimately, you come work your way back down to the most fundamental premises or propositions. And those, according to the intuitionists, are self-evident. Uh, most basic ethical propositions are self-evident. And Ross pulled into this. That sounds rather extravagant, but actually Ross had an incredibly modest epistemology, as I'll go on to say later. He thought there was very little, we had very little moral knowledge. In the realm of the, the morality of right and wrong, he literally thought we knew five things. Uh, and the rest is just what he calls probable opinion. Uh, but he did think those, the, the, what we do know in morals is self-evident. Uh, and I'll say some more about that later. The third distinctive characteristic is their metaphysics or their metaethics. Uh, all the moral intuitionists uh, were moral realists. They believed that our judgments express our beliefs. Moral judgments express moral beliefs. So their, um, their mental states could be true or false. 
and what makes them true when they're true are certain mind independent facts in the world. Uh, and furthermore, unlike many contemporary realists, uh, the intuition is thought that these moral facts can't be reduced to natural facts. That is, they can't be uh, understood in wholly psychological terms or sociological terms or anything like that. Uh, another way to put that is they thought they're irreducibly moral. That is, they can only be defined uh, in moral terms. Uh, so that's their metaphysics. And Ross, although he endorsed all of this, um, I'm not going to say much about that side uh, of his intuitionism. I mean, it's, it's fascinating and interesting. He has some interesting things to say, for example. I mean, he really thought that morality couldn't be invented. It couldn't be a fiction. Uh, and he's got some interesting arguments from that that go back to empiricism. Uh, but I'm not going to say much about that. And the third distinctive characteristic of intuitionism, at least in its Rossian form, is uh, a, th a thesis in the norm normative theory, first order normative theory. Right. For Ross, uh, Ross's plural pluralism, there's, there's an irreducible plurality of basic moral principles. Uh, Ross thought you could get them down to five basic principles, but you couldn't get them any fewer. So he rejected all forms of monism. That is, uh, theories that try to derive all our moral, all the moral truths from a single principle, such as Kantianism or consequentialism. Each of those are monistic theories. Uh, he thinks that they could only, well, the only way in which they could even pretend to succeed is by distorting what, what he says, what we really think. So those are the three features. I'm going to talk mostly about his pluralism and the intuitionism. Uh, the epistemology, both of which are separable from the non-naturalism, I think. So uh, just for those who haven't heard Ross before, his two main books were The Right and the Good, which most people who've read anything of Ross would have read that, at least the first two chapters. Sometimes you get a sense it's only the second chapter and even that up to page 21, uh, for reasons I'll tell you later. Um, and it, uh, a later book in the Foundations of Ethics, where he revised quite a, some few, quite a few of his basic uh, views. Most strikingly, he became a complete subjectivist about morality. Uh, and for no good reason, it seems. <laughs> All he does is repeat the arguments almost verbatim he gets from Pritchard, but they're deeply puzzling and it's not clear how any of that hangs together. Um, but he's best known for his views as they're expressed in the right and the good. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, now, as I said, said before, uh, the right and the good kind of marked the pinnacle of ethical intuitionism, but it very quickly fell out of favour after that, mostly because of the metaethics, the, uh, the moral realism and the epistemology, and was replaced for many decades by the dominance of non-cognitivism. But things started to change in the 1980s, I think. I think it's about them, really. Uh, in part because new forms of moral realism emerged uh, in the form of um, you know, the Cornell realism of Boyd and others. And that gave more confidence to the idea that some sort of moral realism could be sustained. And then once that got on the map again, you don't have to be a non-cognitivist, then people start to think about the nature of those properties and whether they really could be reduced uh, to natural properties again. And so that whole debate came up. And in the 1990s, people like, uh, well, it's mainly Robert Audi, really persuaded us all that the uh, intuitionist epistemology was sustainable. After all, it's not just a mad, moral vision with, with having us go around with some sort of weird moral radar detecting these non-moral truths but it's actually something that's quite sensible and defensible. So it came back into fashion so to speak without demeaning it in the 90s and it's still going strong today I think. Still a minority view but a respectable one uh, with defenders such as David Enoch and uh, Russ Schaefer-Landau 
and many others who are willing to defend not just the uh, pluralism, but more controversially, the, uh, the metaphysics and the uh, epistemology. Okay, so that's a very like five minute history of about the last hundred years of moral philosophy. Uh, so why read Ross? What, what do we learn from Ross? Well, if you listen to many virtue ethicists talking about modern moral philosophy, you think there's just two positions. There's Kant and Kantianism, and there's consequentialism. Uh, and they're the two moral theories. And remember, as I said, they're both monistic theories. They both try to attempt to ground all moral truths as far as they allow for truths, not clear Kant uh, does, uh, in a single principle. Kant complicates things. We've got three different descriptions of that principle, but, but the idea is the same. Uh, however you want to formulate Kant's principle, he's quite clear, he thinks of it as being one fundamental principle. Uh, whether it's expressed in terms of universalizability or in terms of respecting others as ends in themselves. And consequentialism attempts to ground all moral truths uh, in a consequentialist principle, according to which the only thing you ought to do is produce as much intrinsic value in the world as possible. And there's been many versions of that since, but the basic idea is still the same. You ground the right in the good. And uh, so very often a dialectic set up where you've got these two monistic modern theories, and then there's an argument that says, well, you need something that's kind of more context sensitive, uh, allows for a more nuanced way, allows for more concrete facts to get in into our foundational theory. Uh, and these are all the sorts of things that virtue ethicists are fond of saying. But of course, they only motivate their own view by forgetting Ross, who can accommodate all those things. Uh, so it's not a simple theory that tries to ground everything in some abstract theory or principle. His, many of his principles are really quite concrete in nature. And moral deliberation for him is just being sensitive to these different features of the world and their moral relevance and trying to find some way of weighing up the competing claims that are made on us by these different considerations. So Ross's principle, it's not just that Ross has got more principles than monistic theories of modern moral philosophy. Uh, the principles are very different in nature. And this is, I think, the most important shift in Ross. Uh, this is why A.C. Ewing in 1959 describes Ross's uh, theory of prima facie duties, as it became known as, as one of the most important discoveries of 20th century moral theory. Uh, so he changes the nature of those principles, what the principles are principles of, in a way that I think is incredibly important, and the importance of which is often missed, even now. So I'll say something about that a bit later. Uh, so why is this difference? I haven't told you what the difference is yet. I'll tell you in a moment. Uh, but why is this difference so important? Well, I think it has at least three important implications. Uh, it makes a claim to universality to being strictly universal principles, much more plausible. The second is, I think, and this is the most important thing, I think, is that these principles, as he understands them, are much better suited to be fundamental moral principles than the, the more traditional moral principles telling you what you ought to do. And finally, I think uh, Rossian principles are much more plausibly thought out as self-evident than traditional principles. And it can deal with some of the more traditional objections to pluralist theories, uh, such as the objections from Sidgwick and from consequentialists. Right. So uh, I'm going to move on now to his normative theory and say why I think that's so, so important and why we can all learn from this. And the basic idea is that he initiated the move, for as far as I, I can see, the first time in moral philosophy from what we're talking about seeing a moral theory is telling you what you ought to do to telling you what you have reason to do. But the first thing to let in is that 
he, like all the other intuitionists, saw personal relationships as of intrinsic moral importance in a way that other modern moral theories just don't. Um, I mean, consequentialist sees, for example, sees personal relationships as extrinsic to morality, at least in its traditional form. So, uh, actually, I need to, I've got a list of participants that's blocking my reading my own quotes here. How do I get rid of that? Uh, ah, done. Right, sorry about that. So Ross says of consequentialism, a quote from the right and the good here, the essential defect of ideal utilitarian theory is that it ignores, or at least does not do full justice to, the highly personal character of duty. If the only duty is to produce the maximum of good, the question who is to have the good, whether it's myself or my benefactor, or a person to whom I've made a promise to confer that good on him, or a mere fellow man to whom I stand in no such special relation, should make no difference to my having a duty to produce that good. But we're all in fact sure that it makes a vast difference." Unquote. That final sentence is kind of quite distinctive of the way Ross writes. It says, well, they say this, but we all know that's wrong. <laughs> uh, so for ideal utilitarian or all forms, which is his word for a certain type of consequentialism, uh, what matters is producing agent neutral intrinsic value. That's the thing that ultimately matters and anything else only matters instrumentally as a means of bringing about intrinsic goodness into the world. But in terms of one's relation to other people, uh, you know, your happiness is no more intrinsically good than you know, my wife's happiness. Uh, so from a simple consequentialist view, I shouldn't give any preference to the happiness of my wife over the happiness of a stranger. That I stand in that special relationship to her just has no intrinsic moral worth. It only has any moral value or relevance insofar as it contributes towards or giving it importance would make the world a better place. So there may be some ulterior reason for treating it as if it had intrinsic worth, uh, but it, it doesn't actually have it on, the, uh, on a simple consequentialist view. And the same is true for all other personal relationships, those that stem from the fact that we've made a promise or the fact that we benefited in the past from somebody, these make no intrinsic difference, uh, moral difference. And Kant's theory fares no better in this respect. Even if you focus on the formula of humanity, uh, from, uh, from a Kantian point of view, I've got no more reason to give special weight to the humanity of my wife, to the humanity of a stranger. So if respecting others as, in, as ends in themselves requires, say, at least not being indifferent to their ends and promoting their ends to some degree, as far as that goes, I've got no, more, no special reason to give preference to my loved ones than I do to strangers. So there's one personal relationship that just doesn't seem to figure in the account, at least not intrinsically. And Ross thinks this is a mistake, um, and it's quite a deep mistake. Personal relationships are not things that matter to us just because of our emotions or emotional attachments and should really be de uh, you know, ignored from a detached point of view. These are things that are morally important. Uh, and um, so a moral theory should take into account the intrinsic uh, moral relevance of these personal relationships. And that means the worry about, sort of, you know, various worries about mod other moral, modern philosophies, at least get reduced. If you think about some of the objections to Kant and how he has to, a Kantian goodwilled agent has to treat his friends in a slightly detached and alienated way, uh, but there's no reason for a Rossian to act in that way. Um, so this is one important thing, I think, that stems from his pluralism. It allows, uh, and not for the first time, since, because other intuitionists have already allowed this, but it allows personal relationships 
to uh, be recognized as intrinsically morally relevant. And the second thing that's important for him is it's just the plain pluralism. I mean, it's especially important because of the nature of the pluralism, but the fact that it's pluralistic is important. <clears throat> I mean, all normative moral theories aim to ground all moral truths in the smallest number of fundamental moral principles possible. Right? And this is one of the attractions of monistic theories, because the ideal there is to ground everything in one single principle, which makes you a monist if you can do it. So what are the moral truths that we try to ground? Well, I've given you some examples here of just hackneyed examples of putative moral truths, you know, that we ought to be honest, we ought to keep our promises and so on. A monistic theory like Kantians and consequentialist claim or aim that they can ground all of these truths in their single principle. But Ross thinks all such reductions just distort what we already think, what we really think. They lead to false conclusions. I mean, he's still engaged in the same foundationist project as Monis. Uh, he still wants to get the smallest number of basic principles possible. But he thinks you can't reduce it, the basic principles to fewer than five. As soon as you try to do that, you end up with a more and more distorted theory. And you know, just, I mean, he focuses on consequentialism here, but they're pretty standard objections to consequentialism. If you think the only reason you have to do anything morally is that doing that thing will produce the best outcome. Then you've got reason, for example, to punish innocent people, to harvest organs from healthy young people, so you can use the organs to save five terminally ill people, and so on. It's just you can just imagine all the uh, suppose you know the standard suppose counterexamples to consequentialism, and there's plenty of similar counterexamples to uh, you know Kant's principle. Uh, I mean, one thing that can't be Willed as a universal law without contradiction is giving more than the average to charity. Uh, if so, if that's your maxim, giving more than the average to charity, then that's absolutely prohibited by Kant because uh, it it definitely can't be conceived as a universal law uh, for straightforward mathematical reasons. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that principle. That's not my example, by the way. I pinched that from Derek, Derek Parfit. I don't, I don't know if that got into the uh, on what matters, but that was one that stuck with me from some time back. So Ross views the simplicity of monistic theories as just an illusion. This is a kind of general theme run, running through Ross. He just feels that uh, yeah, one of his guiding principles is faithfulness to the facts, as I've got in this quote here, is worth much more than a symmetrical architectonic or a hastily reached simplicity. And that affects his metaphysics as well. Uh, you know, if there are two fundamentally different sorts of properties in the world, moral facts and natural facts, then so be it. If that's the only way you can capture uh, our basic intuitions about the relevant realm, then so be it. That's a cost you have to pay. So, uh, yeah, it's a recurrent theme throughout Ross is what we have here is loyalty to the facts. So then the question becomes, well, what are the facts? Well, the relevant facts we've got to be loyal to. And I've got a couple of quotes here from Ross in The Right and the Good, uh, which give you a taste of what he thinks. Uh, so the first is um, from page 20, a footnote on page 20. The main moral convictions of the play man seem to me to be not opinions, which it is for philosophy to prove or disprove, but knowledge from the start. And in my own case, I seem to find little difficulty in distinguishing these essential convictions from other moral convictions, which I also have, which are merely fallible opinions based on an imperfect study of the working for good or evil of certain institutions or types of acts. And elsewhere he says, the moral convictions of thoughtful and well-educated people are the data of ethics, just as sense perceptions 
are the data of natural science. Now, there's a lot going on there. But one thing to notice, he starts off talking about the moral convictions of the plain man on page 20, but then actually refines that slightly and says, well, it's not really the plain man, but of thoughtful and well-educated people. Uh, secondly, he thinks he can distinguish what he knows from what he merely has an opinion about uh, by internal means. It's just by thinking about it, and it's rather dubious we can do that. Certainly some things uh, seem much closer to uh, being knowledge than mere opinion. Uh, but what we, what, we can, what we get really from introspection is really what we're more certain of, rather than whether some cognition is a, a cognition of knowledge, rather than just mere belief. And another thing he claimed, claims here is that uh, the very final sentence, I think this is quite important, that these moral convictions are the data of ethics just in analogy to, just as sense perceptions are the data of the natural science. So he takes our moral convictions to be, play an analogous role to literally what you can see in the world. So I'm not sure if you can see me now, you might be able to see me in a little box somewhere, uh, but if you can, you can see that I'm wearing glasses. Yeah. Yeah. And why do you believe that I'm wearing glasses? Well, you can just see it. Right? You have that perception. And he thinks that uh, in morality, our moral convictions of a certain sort play the same role as those sort of experiences. Now, this is, this is quite a mixed bag, I think. I mean, there's something to be said for the approach. Of course, we shouldn't pretend to know things we don't know. Uh, and there's plenty of morality we don't know. But more similarly, and more importantly, I think, you know, there's a, a reverse vice where we pretend not to know things that we do know. Um, and he just wants to kind of correct a kind of certain critical caution, which is perfectly respectable, and point out what, well, you know, there's an equal and opposite bias to that, where we pretend not to know things that we know or forget that we know them. I think that's, that's an important corrective. One of the, the real skills of doing philosophy well uh, is knowing what you can rely on uh, and what, what is questionable. And of course, it's much easier to say, well, it's all questionable in the style of that uh, Descartes pretended in the first meditation. Uh, but very, very simple moral truths seem to be ones that we do know. And it, it would be not dishonest, but, uh, well, I think a kind of self-deception to claim we don't know that. And certainly when you put people in a philosophy seminar, all of their moral knowledge goes out the window. They just forget that they know everything. So you ask them, you know, do they, have they got any moral beliefs? They normally say they do. And then you say, well, do you think any of those amount to knowledge? And they'll say, of course, because it's in a philosophy seminar. I say, well, no, no, that would be too much. I say, well, none of them? So you don't know that rape's wrong. Then they think, well, well perhaps I do know that. Uh, uh, then they start to think, but uh, you know, I don't think it's arrogant to claim that rape is wrong or to claim to know that. Uh, it's not like claiming to know how, I don't know, something very complex, like how we should cope with a current health crisis. I claim to know that. Certainly with my knowledge of the relevant facts, that would be laughably arrogant. But it's not laughably arrogant because it's so complicated and involves so much knowledge of empirical facts and even the scientists don't really have a good grasp of that. We're still all learning that. So that would be very arrogant to claim to know that, uh, how we ought to deal with the current health crisis. But is the claim that rape is wrong like that? I mean, what's the complexity there? Is it there's some empirical facts we're unaware of? Well, all the empirical facts I know support it. Um, is there something that uh, you know, might weigh on the other side in favour of it? I mean, it just seems 
almost monstrous to contemplate the idea. Uh, but strangely, Ross would actually deny that we know that rape is wrong because he, as I said, he's got a very strict epistemology and the only things you can know are the basic principles uh, and he wouldn't include that proposition as a basic principle because it's the it's, it has the wrong content. Anyway, that was a long kind of rambling way to say that yeah, we, there's a, a, an equal vice to arrogantly asserting, equal and opposite vice to arrogantly asserting to claim things, to know things you don't know, which is pretending not to know things you do know. And Ross is a good corrective to the, the second vice. So I think that, that that's on the plus side. But on the negative side, I think he, it can't be true that the moral convictions of the plain or even the well-educated people can be the data of ethics. As those convictions are just belief. And for any belief, you need some justification for it. And whatever provides that justification, that will be the data. So I don't think it's the mere fact of our moral convictions, the moral convictions themselves that could be the data of ethics. If those convictions are justified, then it will be whatever justifies them, which will be the data of ethics. In my own view, as I'll come to you later, so I don't think what justifies our moral convictions is other beliefs. So that's uh, one thing, and I'll come back to that later. Also, if you think that the moral convictions are the data of ethics, then you haven't got anything that's really analogous to perception in empirical knowledge. Uh, perception in empirical knowledge explains your perceptual convictions. It's not your, your perceptual convictions justify your perceptual convictions. Your perceptions do. So I'm looking at it. Take, take my word for this. I'm looking at a green wall now. Uh, what justifies my conviction that the wall is green is that I can see it's green, or at least that it appears green. Um, so what Ross wants, if he's going to push the analogy with perception, is something not belief-like at all, but something analogous to that experiential, uh, the perceptual experience or the perceptual seeming. Then he'd have something that's quite strictly analogous uh, to sense perception and perceptual beliefs. So what justifies our basic moral convictions? Right? I mean, if, they're not, if they're not justified, they definitely shouldn't be the data of uh, ethical theory. If they are justified, then it would be what justifies them that provides the data of ethical theory. So what is it that justifies those basic moral convictions? Well, Robert Audi and Schaefer Landau claim that it's an adequate understanding of their propositional content that does this. Now, for both of them, uh, it's what justifies us in believing uh, self-evident propositions and intuitive propositions um, isn't our adequate understanding of those propositions. So if you take the proposition that rape is wrong, if that's self-evident, or at least it's intuitive, then what justifies your belief that rape is wrong for them is your adequate understanding of that very proposition. But my own view is that the understanding of basic propositions is an odd thing to claim as a data of ethics. And there's other things that's wrong with this view as well, I think. Uh, so I think we should take the perceptual analogy more strictly and take intuitions understood as a sort of perceptual state to be the data of ethics. Uh, so I think we should move away from the idea that what justifies our beliefs, uh, our basic moral convictions as being our understanding of the, their propositional content uh, to an intuition with the same content. So I take it that, you know, put it formally, an intuition that P justifies you in believing that P but I don't, that's possible because I don't think intuitions are beliefs. In fact, I don't think they could be beliefs uh, or even dispositions to belief. 
um, what an intuition is in my view and this is not original this is just me following uh the philosopher george beeler uh, is something like a perceptual state of something seeming to be a certain way. Now, Ross sometimes talks of intuitions, well, he doesn't talk of intuitions, actually. One of the striking things about intuition is they never talk about intuitions, not the classical ones. But he has something that looks like it might be what we would call an intuition, when he talks of apprehensions. That sounds much more like a a kind of perceptual state, literally seeing the truth of something. So uh, that looks like it. if there are such things, intellectual apprehensions or seeings, then they would look like the sort, right sort of thing to justify a belief with the same content. So just as my apprehension of the wall as green, my seeing that it's green, or the perceptual state of it seeming green um, can justify me in believing that it's green. So our apprehension of the truth of some moral proposition could justify us in believing that proposition. That looks like it's the right sort of thing, A, to be the data of ethics, and B, to justify our basic moral intuitions. But the problem with apprehension is it, it's what philosophers call for a factive mental state. So if you apprehend that P, then P. Uh, and I think what intuition is need, what we need as moral philosophers need, is something that's fallible and so non-factive. So the relevant uh, experiential-like state, I think, constitutes intuitions, intellectual intuitions, is that of an intellectual seeming, something seeming to be true, some proposition seeming to be true. And that's something strictly analogous to the idea of something seeming to be a certain way perceptually, like the wall seeming to be green. But I look at it, it seems to be green, and it's seeming green justifies me in believing that it's green, absent kind of certain defeaters. And then we take that over to the idea of intuition as an intellectual seeming. And there's certain propositions when you think about them suddenly strike you as true. Right, they suddenly seem true, it's like a light going on. And that seeming is how I think of intuitions. And I do think, I think those seemings are the data of ethics. Now, if that's a right sort of move to make, and I'll say some more about that later, then it shifts the emphasis away from self-evidence and self-evident propositions to intu intuitions, understood as intellectual seemings, and intuitive propositions. So what are, the, what are the propositions that are intuitive and the sort of thing that could be the fundamental moral propositions that we could come to know by intuition? That when we think of them, they seem true. Uh, or when we get an adequate understanding of them, they seem true to us. Well, Ross's initial list is quite long. Uh, initially, it's on page 20 of The Right and the Good. He lists seven duties, that of fidelity, reparation, right, repairing for past wrongs. Fidelity includes promises, both explicit and implicit. Implicit promises are ones where it's kind of mutually assumed that you'll respond in a certain way if you get, get a certain service. So for example, when you get in a taxi, uh, and ask the taxi driver to take you home. You don't have to promise to pay, explicitly promise to pay him when he gets you home. That's just understood. So that would be, there'd be an implicit promise there of you know, paying the fare when he takes you home, even though you haven't said, I promise to pay you whatever shows on the meter uh, when you get me home. Duties of reparation, well, that's repairing for past wrongs. So these duties relate to uh, things you've done in the past. So things you ought to do now because of things you've done in the past that you have to repair for. Sometimes repairing could just be apologizing. Uh, sometimes that's not enough. Uh, but in any case, that, that, that he takes to be a fundamental principle. Then we have principles of gratitude, 
Uh, I won't say anything about that. That's just you know, returning a favor in effect. The duty of justice, but he understands that in a strict way, which is um, as a distrib distribution of certain goods to those who deserve it. So we ought to do that when we can. Then he has beneficence, helping others, self-improvement, uh, improving yourself in respect of virtue and knowledge, and non-maleficence, a separate duty of, uh, this is the only negative one, against harming others. Now on page 20 of the Right and the Good, Ross says that this list is not exhaustive. Uh, so many, many com not really commentators on Ross, but many people who are kind of casual readers of Ross say, well, he just gives us seven principles, uh, but he says they're not exhaustive, so there may be more, um, and you just keep adding to the list, whatever you need. When people say that, they just show they haven't read past page 20, because uh, on page 27, by the time he gets to the end of page 27, he's actually reduced some of those principles, uh, subsumed them under others. Uh, and there he says, you know, having reduced it to five principles, so these seem to be in principle all the ways in which prima facie duties arise. So what are the five principles? Well, basically they're the same as the first list. All that's happened is that the duty of justice, self-improvement and beneficence all get subsumed under the duty to promote the good. So what you have in the final list, which as I say, if we go back to the, uh, which in principle expresses all the ways in which prima facie duties arrive. So that, there he does seem to think this is an exhaustive list now. These are his five basic principles. Uh, the first three are the ones that rest upon special relationships to others, either people you've made a promise to, people you've wronged, or people who have benefited you in the past. And then there's two what he calls general duties of promoting good, the good and avoiding harm. And they don't rest upon any uh, special relationship to others. It's just that you ought to help anybody whenever you can. Now I've been talking about these as duties and what you ought to do. But as I said earlier, Kant's, sorry, uh, Ross's fundamental change is to shift away from what you ought to do to something else, which has come to be known as what he calls principles of prima facie duty. So traditional moral principles state what we ought to do. And if monism is true, they state there's only one thing ultimately you ought to do. Uh, but if monism is, monism is false, uh, you can't have principles telling you what you ought to do if they're to be universal. And that's just because they can conflict. So, you know, if in a case where you, uh, the duty to keep your promise conflicts with the duty to help others, it can't be true that you ought to do both of those things because you can't. You ought to do one of them, whichever one is the more pressing. Uh, so you don't get strictly universal principles if you're a pluralist about what you ought to do. Uh, but Ross wants to hold on to the idea of strictly universal principles. So his suggestion is to distinguish between what he calls duty proper and prima facie duty, and maintains that the basic principles are principles of prima facie duty only. And it's this that this shift from duty proper to prima facie duty, which A.C. Ewing described as one of the most important discoveries in modern moral philosophy, or modern moral philosophy in the 20, 20th century. So what is the distinction? Well, the easier one to get is the idea of duty proper. That's just what you ought to do, all things considered. And in one situation, any particular situation, there'll only ever be one thing you ought to do. That's not strictly true, but uh, uh, yeah, standardly, there'll just be one thing you ought to do. Prima facie duties are not what you ought to do, but they're the moral, morally relevant facts that determine what your duty proper is. That is, they determine what it is you ought to do. And there may be more, and typically are, 
more than one such prime facie duty. So just to take the you know, two morally relevant facts in a conflict situation I just mentioned. So suppose you made a promise to your friend to meet him at a certain time, but on the way uh, you could help an accident victim who's uh, in serious distress. So there are two morally relevant facts here. The fact that you made the promise to your friend counts in favour of doing that and leaving the person who, you know, not helping. And the fact that you could do some good by helping the accident victim. So that obviously counts in favour of helping the accident victim. So these are examples of what Ross would call prima facie duties of fidelity to promises and beneficence. Now, whichever prima facie duty is the more stringent in this case will determine what your duty proper is. So if you think it's more important, well, if it's, if it's more important to keep your promise, then that's what you ought to do. That's what your duty proper is. And if it's more important to help the accident victim, then that's what you ought to do. So there's two morally relevant facts here, but just one thing you ought to do. Uh, and it's those morally relevant facts that he calls prima facie, that they're your prima facie duties. Now the trouble with this term, and he struggled with this term for, for both in both the right and the good, and also he came back to this in the foundations of ethics, is the term prima facie duty is doubly misleading because it's neither prima facie nor a type of duty. Uh, and I've got a quote here where he states that. Um, now, most, most philosophers today recognize that you know, prima facie duty doesn't mean what seems to be a duty at first sight. But the more important point, I think, is the second, uh, the second claim that isn't, or oh, sorry, the first claim that it's not actually a type of duty. Uh, as he says, it's uh, the term suggests that what we're speaking of is a certain kind of duty, whereas in fact it's not a duty, but something related in a special way to duty. Now, as I say, most people are aware of the epistemic misleading nature of the, the term, but there's this more fundamental way in which it's misleading. So if it's not a type of duty, what, what is it? Well, Ross has various goes of defining it in the right and the good. Uh, and there he tries to define it with reference to duty proper. And he has a couple of goes. Uh, so for example, he has a counterfactual account of prime face duty. Some act is prima facie right. If it has a feature that would make, make it, sorry, would make it uh, our all things considered duty, our actual duty, if there are no other morally relevant facts. So I missed out a few words in that. Uh, sometimes he understands it as a sort of tendency that say some act, some feature is prima facie right, is say it has a feature that tends to make it actually right. Well, that tendency is not statistical, it's more like a force tending to push something a certain way, a kind of deontic force. Uh, and he has a, some uh, further attempts at clarifying the notion in the foundations, uh, but I won't go through those. I mean, my own view is that this, the notion of a prima facie right and wrong act is best understood just in terms of features that count in favor or against doing the action. Right? And that's quite a familiar thought uh, when you're trying to weigh up what you ought to do. There'll be some facts that count in favor of doing it and some facts that count against doing it. And in trying to do, decide what you ought to do, you've got to weigh up those competing factors. But how do they count in favor or against certain acts? Well, it looks like the only answer can be by providing moral reasons to do those acts or not to do them. So I understand prima facie duties and principles of prima facie duties as principles of moral reasons. Understood in these terms, you know, we could translate Ross's principle. I won't go through all of these, but the principle of fidelity will no longer be a duty of fidelity what that principle will state is the fact that I've made a promise is always a moral reason to do what I've promised, right? And, you know, they'll all be understood in that sort of way. The fact that someone's benefited me in the past is always a reason to benefit them when you can, and so on. 
So this is the move from principle stating what you ought to do to principle stating what you've got reason to do. And although Ross doesn't use the term moral reason, because the term reason doesn't figure in his vocabulary, uh, he does it all in terms of deontic and evaluative notions such as right, duty, good and bad. I think the idea is getting at was to move from principle stating what we morally ought to do to principle stating what facts provide what reasons. This is important for at least two reasons. Principles of duty proper can't be the most fundamental principles. And I think this is a deep point that Ross enabled us to see. And secondly, there's no strictly universal principles stating what we ought to do. At least they're not um, if pluralism is true. So why can't principles of duty proper be basic? Well, they have to be basic. The idea that normative moral theory is trying to do is trying to come up with the fun most fundamental moral principles from which we can derive all other moral truths. But once we see the relation between duty proper and prima facie duty, we can see that principles of duty proper can't be fundamental. Uh, and you don't need Rossi's terminology to see this. All you need is the idea that for anything you ought to do, there'll be a reason why you ought to do it. There'll be an explanation of the deontic fact that you ought to do it. And whatever figures in that explanation of why you ought to do, whatever it is you ought to do, will be a more fundamental morally uh, than the fact that you ought to do that action. It'll be more fundamental because it explains why you ought to do that action. And not only that, uh, I think, I, mean, I've no, I haven't got an argument for this, but it seems to me that whatever explains why you ought to do some act will provide you with a reason to do that act. So for instance, if you promise to meet somebody and nothing defeats that, the reason provided by the, the promise, then you ought to, to meet that person. Why ought you to meet them? Well, what explains that ought is the fact that you promised. So what reason do you have to meet them? Well, at least one reason is provided by the fact that you promised. So the same fact that explains why you ought to do that action will stand in a normative relation to you and give you a reason to do it. And that's, I think, a fundamental feature of what I call deontic explanations, explanations of deontic facts. That they not only provide an explanatory reason of the deontic fact, the fact that you ought to do some action, but also give you a reason, a normative reason, to do what it is you ought to do. Making the issue of, uh, at least under one understanding, the issue of uh, moral motivation completely redundant. So it's these explanatory facts that are more fundamental, and those explanatory facts are, the more fundamental explanatory facts are principles of prima facie duty, not duty proper. That's why you can't stop at principles stating what you ought to do, because there'll always be an explanation of what you ought to do. And the explanation uh, won't be a further route, because that just leads to a regress. So it has to, be in terms of another normative notion, and I've suggested that the right sort of normative notion is that of a moral reason. Right, as for universality, uh, think of a trolley problem. Those of you, most of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, there you are, standing by a lever, which if you pull it will divert the trolley from the main track onto the spur track. There's a runaway trolley on the main track. If you do nothing, uh, it will run over and kill five people who happen to be working on the main track. If you pull the lever, you'll save those five. But there's, some, there's unfortunately, there's one person working on the spur track. So if you pull the lever, you'll save the five, but kill the one innocent person on the spur track. And then the problem is, well, what should you do? Should you save the five or let them die? Or you know, save the five and kill the one? Well, Ross asks a different question. 
you know, in his own terminology. He said, well, what reason do you have to favor pulling the lever? Right? And that the, it's clear the reason in favor, at least a reason in favor of pulling the lever is that you prevent five deaths. What's the reason against pulling it? Well, clearly the reason against pulling the lever is that one person will die if you do. Now, if the reason against pulling the lever is defeated and your duty prop is to pull the lever, that's what you ought to do. But a defeated reason against doing some act is still a reason against. Even though you, even in cases where you ought to kill one innocent person, as many people think you should do in this case, that you would kill the innocent person is still a reason against pulling the lever. It's just that it's defeated. So you couldn't get a principle of duty proper saying that uh, it's always wrong to kill an innocent person, because if you think uh, it's permissible to pull the lever in this case, and it's not always wrong to kill an innocent person, that might actually be required of you. But that you'd kill someone is always a reason against. So it's um, so even a very plausible theory about what you ought and ought not to do, such as the principle stating that it's always wrong to kill an innocent person, that looks vulnerable to counterexamples and doesn't look as though well, it'd be quite hard to sustain the idea that that's strictly universal. But if you understand it as a principle of prima facie duty, it's much easier to think of it as strictly universally true, which is how Ross would think of it. That is, there's no situation in the fact that you'd kill an innocent person doesn't count against doing it, even if you ought to do the act that would involve killing that person. Uh, so the second advantage of the uh, moving to principles of prima facie duty is that um, you can get universality. Right, how many, I'm kind of very conscious of time. I think I, think I started a bit late. So, uh, if you could give me a few more minutes, I'll see yeah. if I can get through some of this. Um... Let's say ten, 10 more minutes, all right? 10 more minutes, okay, I, hopefully it won't take that long. I'll try no. and finish by 10 past. Okay, so self-evidence. What is it for a proposition to be self-evident? Uh, well, roughly speaking, uh, it's for that proposition to be knowable just by thinking about it. No argument or empirical evidence is needed. It's not to say you can't be God, but it's not needed for knowledge of a self-evident proposition. Now, here's an example. This is a kind of a moral proposition, I think, or an evaluative proposition, um, but it's quite a formal one. And it looks like it's a sort of thing uh, that's self-evident. And there's reasons to think it's not because there's, re there's some arguments to say that it's false, but, but here's the proposition. The transitivity of better than. And for those of you who, who don't know what that is, it's the following principle. If A is better than B and B is better than C, then A is better than C. Now that seems true. Uh, and it seems like it's a principle that we could know to be true. And we, how do you know it? Well, you know about it by thinking about it. You think of possible combinations of different goods and their relations. Uh, and you can see that, hope, you know, putting aside some rather clever arguments to the contrary, you can see that in each case, this comes out true. And at some point, it may seem to you as necessarily true. It won't just present itself to the mind as true, but seem to you as if it couldn't be otherwise. Things couldn't be otherwise. It couldn't just be a if it's true, it couldn't be a contingent truth about this world. So it looks like you can come to know that principle, assuming it's true, just by thinking about the relevant concepts of better than and the objects signified by A, B, and C, and their relationships. But what about the self-evidence of prima facie duties? I think it's a uh, consideration of the trolley case makes it look uh, easy to justify the idea that these sorts of principles, principles of prima, prima facie duty, making it more plausible to suppose they're self-evident. Uh, 
whenever I ask my students what they should do in the trolley case, whether they should pull the lever or not, typically you get about 70% of them say you should uh, pull the lever and about 30% say you shouldn't. Uh, but then if you put the, say, well, does the fact you'll be saving five people count in favor of pulling the lever? Then you get close to 100%. And if you ask them whether uh, the fact that you'd be killing an innocent person by pulling the lever, does that count against it? Typically, there are exceptions, because occasionally you get an error theorist in the audience. But the intuition is that that, that clearly counts against. And that counts against regardless of whether you should think you should or shouldn't pull the lever. So I think principles of prime facie duty, at least if you think that a kind of consensus criterion uh, is not so much a condition of something being some proposition being self-evident, but should strengthen or weaken your confidence in its self-evidence, then principles of prime facie duty come out stronger, I think. Now, I think that at least some of Ross's principles of prime face of duty seem true after reflection. And I take their seeming true as evidence for their truth. Uh, so this is another way in which I think in intuitions as intellectual seemings uh, is analogous to perceptual seemings. I take it that the fact that the wall seems green when I look at it is evidence that it is green. It's defeasible evidence, it could be outweighed or completely undercut, but it is some evidence for the truth of the proposition that it is green. And similarly, that some proposition seems true when you consider it is, I think, evidence in just the same way for its being true, absent, undercutting defeaters. You need that, that qualification because there's plenty of um, apparent truths or things that seem true that are just yeah we know are false uh, i always give the example because i'm so bad at mathematics i have very bad mathematical intuitions so i've got the intuition which persists even though i know it's false that there are more natural numbers one two three four five than there are even numbers but i know that's false uh, there are just as many natural numbers as there are even numbers and that still seems true to me when i think about it i just look at the imagine the sequence and just think there can't be as many natural numbers as even numbers because the even ones just every other natural number but then i have to run through the proof that uh, there's a function linking every natural number to an even number you just double it and then i can see on the basis of that argument not on the basis of intuition that there's as many even numbers as there are natural numbers. Uh, so that argument undercuts, or at least if, I think that's a, perhaps it outweighs, uh, not sure. But anyway, that, that means that the justification is weakened and on balance. I don't believe that things are the way they seem. And I don't think believe that things are the way they seem in that mathematical case, because I've got an argument which tells me they're not as they seem. So in the case of uh, self or a putative self-evident moral proposition, the principle of prima facie duty, I think we're justified in believing those propositions, uh, although that justification may be outweighed. There may be some good argument to show they can't be true or that they're not true, just as in the mathematical case. Uh, but absent such uh, uh, defeaters, I think the seemings, intellectual seemings, provide default justifications for our basic moral convictions. It's not those convictions, as Ross sometimes says, that are the data of first order normative theory, but the corresponding seemings. And that's not dogmatic, so long as we recognize that such intuitions provide any defeasible justification. So they may be outweighed or completely undercut. Then the question is what to do. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. I'm on the final slide here. Just get it back. 
Then what do we do with the, the apparent defeaters? The trouble with these, they come in quite a variety of flavors. Uh, some uh, apparent defeaters are just at the same level. They're just first order normative arguments that some proposition uh, that seems true isn't. And actually Ross had uh, doubts about this with in relation to the prima facie duty to promote the good and what he regarded as a self-evident proposition that pleasure is intrinsically good. So he quickly came to the conclusion that entailed that we're morally obligated, have some competing considerations, to promote our own pleasure where we can't help others or do something good for others. And he thought that although it's sensible to get a bit of pleasure for yourself, it's not a moral obligation. Um, as it happened in the right and the good, he couldn't see what was wrong with the original principles and he couldn't abandon any of them. So he did embrace that rather implausible consequence that when we miss a, a, an occasion to have a bit of fun, absent other competing considerations, we've done something morally wrong. Uh, that, that seems to me where his first order thinking just went a bit haywire. Uh, but also you might think that you know, there might be, a, but that, that's the kind of case where you're just reflecting at the first order level and thinking about the implications of the propositions that are supposed to be, you know, the putative self-evident propositions, whether they have any kind of implausible consequences. Similarly, you might think that, you know, for every supposed universal principle, even at the prima facie level, uh, you might think they can't be universally true because there's always particular cases where they don't apply. So Jonathan Dancy's particularism would undercut all of Ross's prima facie duties if we regard those as strictly universal. But that's all at the first order and they just have to be dealt on their own merits. Some undercutting arguments don't just outweigh um, the justification provided by intuition but completely undercut it. And I think evolutionary debunking arguments are supposed to work like this. They completely undermine the uh, justification provided by intuitions as seemings by, say, by basically offering an alternative explanation as why certain propositions seem true to us. They seem true to us, they would say, just because their seeming true has survival value. Not because they are true, but because their seeming true has survival value because it leads us, makes us more likely to believe that they're true and that has survival value. And since survival has nothing to do with moral truth, uh, so they argue uh, that's, a, that's a moral proposition seems to be true, is no justification for believing it's true. Those sorts of objections, and you get similar sort of objections from empirical psychology just need to be addressed. And David Enoch's offered some good arguments um, I actually think that the whole debunking argument rests on a, quite a deep mistake, which means that none of them work. They all make a fundamental mistake, none of them work. Uh, but yeah, you need to see the argument for that. But having said all of that, I think it's perfectly respectable to respond to some metaphysical objections in a Morian way. That is, by rejecting some premise of the argument against the proposition, rather than embrace the falsity of the moral intuition the opposing view supposedly undermines. And what I'm thinking of here is arguments for certain error theories. Uh, not all of them, but I think they, they tend to fall into this sort of category. Uh, I mean, if error theory is true, then rape's not wrong, right? So given we're so certain that rape is wrong, and that really does look like something you could without immodesty claim to know, then they better have premises that entail that it's not wrong, which have the same sort of epistemic weight. And the problem is that there's always some key step in their argument that has nowhere near the epistemic weight of the proposition that they conclude uh, is false, namely rape is wrong and all other moral propositions. So I think that's in the, those sorts of cases, uh, 
you know, I've, I've referred to this as a sort of morium response. That, that's a perfectly respectable way to respond. Sometimes this is the only sensible way to deal with some philosophical theories that have conclusions none of us can believe. Notice that error theorists are completely indistinguishable from the rest of us. Uh, they don't seem like moral monsters. They don't act as if nothing's right or wrong. They act just like us. Um, I'm not sure that's compatible with the theories they claim to believe. But this is the method used by most intuitionists, this sort of morium response to such views, including Ross, and seems to me the right way to make progress uh, in moral philosophy and to keep your philosophical feet on the ground. Okay, that's that's went on a bit longer than I meant to. Apologies for that. That's especially since that's a, uh, this is a virtual conference and um, probably harder to listen to for that reason. But uh, that's it for me now. I'll stop and uh, open. Uh, pass over to Anna to uh, deal with questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ruth. It was really interesting, exactly as we wanted. I mean, you really did the job of, of giving us some, some tools to understand Rose better. I, I, it was really uh, helpful, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to hear reactions from people here, because I know that many people precisely wanted came here for that. They wanted to uh, here's something about Rose coming from you. So if you have any questions, please, please do. I would, I, I would be happy to start if you, if you don't mind, since I, I have one tiny, uh, I mean, well, my, my background uh, is rather, rather particularism, obviously, but the, the same tradition, but obviously, yeah. And I, I still, um, I, I don't, uh, the, the, the story of intuitions, on, uh, which are not beliefs, how do you deal with this? I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I think you deal with it like you deal with perceptual seemings that won't go away. You know, when you think of a Muller liar illusion, you know the lines are the same length, but it doesn't stop them seeming that way. Uh, and whenever I think about, you know, my mathematical analogy of uh, the, you know, the number of even numbers versus natural numbers, Whenever I think of that, I can't help but think they've got, there's got to be more. <laughs> but I know that then I have to remind myself of the argument. So I think that's true. That's how consequentialists go into a moral case. I'm sure act consequentialists have the same intuitions as the rest of us. They just don't believe them. Yeah, but come on. Intuition, as, <laughs> if it is taken seriously, I'm giving the, the, the I'm letting David enough to speak in a second, but uh, in the, if it's taken seriously, it, it is not, how can it be even different from a belief? The fact that it does not uh, work in, you know, as a uh, uh, inference or that it's like in, intuitive, it does not mean that it's different from a belief. And I, I, I really oh, no. struggle to... But um, well, I do think that the recount, I mean, you could hold that intuitions are a certain sort of belief, but then this recalcitrance problem actually turns out to be something, well, it exaggerates a sort of men mental kind of incoherence you're in when you have intuitions you don't believe, because it'll be like a consequentialist uh, believing that it's wrong to harvest the organs of a young man to save five, and believing that it's not wrong because he has an intuition that it's wrong but he believes it's permissible and i don't think they're in that bad a mental state i mean there is a kind of incoherence in having intuitions that you don't believe things aren't meshing but that's the way things are i think okay so we'll certainly come back to this because i think it's super crucial the, the definition of what intuition is but david wanted to, he wanted to say something Thank you, Philip. That was that was very helpful and also fun. Um, can I may I ask two questions? Um, so one is about uh, seemings, and I'm I'm with you about pretty much everything. Uh, but once we're talking about seemings, as I also think we should, rather than about self-evidence, then it's no longer clear we should talk about principles. We may talk about uh, at least in some cases, the seemings we have about specific cases are at least as powerful phenomenologically as seemings about principles, and sometimes even when they go against our principles. So this may come down to the question of uh, can uh, 
you know, is, is it a problem that Ross hasn't read roles on the reflective equilibrium, right? That, uh, uh, something like that. We may need as inputs intellectual seemings both about principles and about particular kids. Oh, no. I mean, I mean Ross thinks that, <coughs> well, that intellectual seemings is not his term. No, 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 no. It's about uh, you. <laughs> but um, he thinks that we can see that some particular act is prima facie wrong. Uh, and that. Uh, that we can see that's you know, universal principles from them. Sometimes when he's talking about the prima facie duty of keeping your promise, he thinks you can see that in a particular case. Um, and that's fine. That all fits with the seeming view because it just depends what proposition seems true. The, the proposition that uh, you ought to keep your promise is one. Uh, that might seem true, but it might on reflection seem that necessarily you ought to keep your promise or you have a prima facie duty to keep your promise um, and that's just a difference in content what it is that seems true or it might seem true that yeah it's always a prima facie right thing to keep your promise or something of that sort so you can cap a seeming account of intuition can capture the idea of particular things seem true yeah you might watch the video of george floyd that terrible video and it just strikes you how wrong that is. And that's a particular, very particular case. Uh, and you might have, it might seem to you that necessarily that's wrong, that any situation just like that would be wrong. That means that the five or seven principles, uh, prima facie principles, while they may enjoy some kind of metaphysical priority, need not enjoy a similar epistemological priority. Uh, no, no, he doesn't think that. Okay. The principles don't have. An, he thinks you can good, kind of. Good. Uh, you can certainly get to the principles from from starting with a, 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 an intuition of a particular case. Uh, so it can go both both ways, or you might just see straight off the principle. Uh, just you know, just through imagination, you don't need a particular case. Good. So, um, second question. I, I looked hard and found something that I think I can disagree with. Um, when you explained uh, why, fundament, why according to Ross, fundamental moral principles can't be uh, of a duty proper, but only of uh, prima facie duties, mm. yeah, uh, you said something like, uh, whenever we ought to do something, there must be an explanation for that. Why? I'm not sure I could answer that. Uh, but. I can't think of a situation where uh, it wouldn't be appropriate. If you tell somebody they ought to do something, where it couldn't be appropriate to say, well, why? Why, sh why should I do it? And then you're into deontic explanations. You're trying to give them a reason to do what they ought to do. You're pointing out the reason that explains why they have this, you know, if it's a moral ought, moral obligation. Uh, so as I say, I don't have an argument for that. It just seems to me that Alts, you just couldn't have free floating alts. That you ought to do this, but there's no reason why you ought to do it. That seems to me incoherent. So I'd agree, of course, that the vast majority of arts are not free floating. But um, I, I'm happy to accept that some are, that the most fundamental are. Uh, uh, and that is actually, um, I'm, I'm not sure, and I really don't know my Ross well enough, but this may be a place where there is a metaphysical dispute. So this may be, uh, this principle may be motivated by the thought that no art is absolutely fundamental. So that the fundamental furniture of the universe does not include an art. It may include reasons, but it does not include an art. Um, which is, you know, if you want, maybe one way of understanding Mackey on queerness and so on. Right? Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure I have an argument why that's false, but I, I would like to see an argument why it's true. Uh, that's fair enough. No, I mean, you're not alone. I mean, I, th uh, I think Tom Herker thinks that, you know, some alts are just, right, yeah, just fundamental and that's it. Uh, and perhaps you just say, well, the reason why you ought to do that is just, you know, give a Kantian answer. It's just that's what you ought to do. Um, I mean, certainly what happens is the explanations get quite thin as you get to the more and more fundamental. That's true, yeah. uh, I mean, they're not going to persuade anybody who wasn't already persuaded that's what they mm -hmm. want to do. 
Um, but sometimes, I mean, just take uh, the prime face duty of fidelity to promises. It's actually unclear, I think, in Ross, what explains why you ought to keep your promise. Sometimes he says it's the mere fact that you've made a promise that explains, you know, you ought to, to meet so-and-so. Why, why should I do that? Well, because you promised. That has some explanatory force. But sometimes he says it's not the promise as such, the fact that you've made the promise, but the fact that the person you promised relies on you to do what you promised. Uh, and they're, they're quite different things. They each have their own problems, but both of those seem to be perfectly good answers and we're, we're at quite a fundamental level here. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't persuade an amoralist that they ought to keep their promise just because they made it. But persuading, you, know, argue, you just need an argument. You don't need to be able to persuade people. I agree with that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very tough uh, battle between two realists. No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a bit of a... Yeah. But um, we have a question from uh, Marcus, who's not able to, to talk to us. But he, he says, I, I, I quote, thank you for an excellent talk. I have a question which I hope I can post in the chat. Uh, it also concerns concerns Ross's intuitionism and Rawls' reflective equilibrium. Rawls, of course, describes his justificatory approach as a, some kind of alternative to intuitionism. And he seems skeptical to the idea of self-evident principles. But it also seems to me that Rawls, like many others, accept some kind of pluralism about value. So what do you think of a kind of plural, pluralism uh, which is less, less optimistic about justification than both Rawls and Ross, i.e. there is a plurality of values, but we can't order them neatly through either reflective equilibrium or by relying or seeming or similar? Um, good question. Uh, I mean, Ross's view is, although it's self-evident that each of those principles are self-evident, it's not self-evident how they're ranked. Uh, and, you and, and you can't even know in a particular, you, cer you certainly can't know in a particular case which consideration is more important than the other. That's why he's so skeptical, actually, about what, what, what it is we can know in morality. Uh, he thinks that most moral situations are so complex, involving a great deal of empirical knowledge that we often don't have access to and weighing up different competing moral considerations and weighing those in a way that we can't have any confidence of the outcome. That's why he thinks we can't know any, anything about particular situations. I actually think that's, that's too extreme. I think he's too skeptical actually. Um, I mean, there's, as I mentioned before, there are certain situations very prominent in the news now, which I don't think it'd be arrogant to claim that we know that such actions are wrong. Because uh, they don't seem that complicated, it seems. There might be, I suppose there might be empirical facts we're unaware of that would vindicate such actions. That's always possible, I guess. But um, absent those complications, it looks like... Um, yeah, we could claim to know those. Uh, but yeah, he doesn't think it's self-evident that you can know the ranking. He does think that at some general level, some considerations are more important than others. So for example, if you could literally rank harms and benefits on a, a single scale uh, and uh, allocate individual units, like two units of harm you know, to gain benefit somebody else, say three units of benefit, it might be that even if those two considerations are the only relevant ones, you ought not to benefit the person by harming the one because he thinks that the, the, the ban or the prima facie duty not to harm is more stringent than the prima facie duty to benefit. Um, so he thinks there's a kind of, but it's very hard in a particular situation to make sense of this. Uh, and it's certainly not something you could know in a particular situation you know, what level of benefit would justify what level of harm? Uh, and that always seemed to be like a kind of bad question, as if there's a, you know, people, people often ask, well, you know, where do you draw the line? I said, 
almost always that question's a bad question because it's almost never a line. <laughs> There's kind of gray area and that's, that gray area is not just epistemic. Yeah. I'll give the example, I mean, many of you are very young and I'm old. Uh, you say, well, where, where's the line? Where do you stop being young? And when you're young, you want to know this. <laughs> when am I no longer young? When do I become old? There is a terrible question. It's not like a midnight when you're, I don't know, 35, when you're 35th birthday, you wake up an old person. But there's definitely a distinction between young people and old people. Uh, and it's often the case with uh, morality, you know, on a more serious note, that yeah, asking where the line is is just a bad question. There's no line. Uh, and you've just got to exercise judgment. And you know, because the moral world is complicated and, and messy. But this is precisely why judgment has to be as close as possible with beliefs, you know, uh, this is why intuitions should be really connected to beliefs, since you, it's, you know, what, before the intuition becomes an intuition, it was first a belief that was formed in, in a way or on a, another, right? I, I take it, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I see the fact of two questions, but I'm just following up with your, your remarks. There's this, uh, you know, um, I made an, empir uh, an empirical study of homophobia and people, oh. quite, uh, you know, quite often they, they say that, you know, um, they are just, uh, they have this intuition, they just cannot accept homosexuality, right? And then you, you, you start a conversation and actually you see that it's not an intuition at all, there is a set of beliefs. And once you, you, you show that those beliefs are false, and it's quite, you know, it, it takes some time, mm. but the intuition, the, the, the automatic response changes. So this is why I, I, I can, I just, I don't even see how this can be disconnected. Yeah, uh, but I don't know that empirical research, and I, I suspect it, it's really quite hard to pin things down here. I mean, especially with psychologists, they don't have a very tight notion of an intuition, they just, not not as as philosophers tend to understand it they just go with gut reactions uh but there's also a question of whether not whether or not they had these these intuitions of not you know a, anti or uh, homophobic intuitions there's also kind of questions of self-deception you might claim you know not to be a racist but then i don't know isn't there kind of cases where judges you know, claim not to be racist and that just doesn't show up in their pattern of uh, judgments that they, uh, you know, where you compare similar white and black people, um, uh, people's crimes that they tend to give the black uh, person more harsh pun punishments for the same crime. And that's just a case of self-deception. That's not a case, I mean, intuition doesn't really get in there. They think they're perfectly decent and, you know, liberal people, but their actions betray them. But you are totally right that there is a difference between the understanding by the, of the notion of intuition by psychologist and by by us but we'll come back to this and i'll just ask uh, someone whose nickname is 014031 could you please ask your question dear okay uh, actually uh, can you hear me yes oh it is marta yeah. yes it's marta yes i just didn't know how i i changed the number i don't know why they assigned me a number anyway Wonderful. so i have changed it thank you so much for the talk i agree with you that uh, Ross is very seductive and promising <laughs> for dealing with uh, contemporary issues. My question concerns the analogy between uh, intellectual seemings and perceptual seemings. Mm. And it seems to me that, uh, and I think Williams made also that point, um, uh, it's uh, uh, actually there is a, 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 a this analogy in in the uh, in dealing with disagreement about if you have you got two people disagreeing about perceptual seemings it seems you know big to me it seems small to me or or even you know uh, even more more precise than that there are ways at least that you can imagine to resolve that disagreement maybe it's not de 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 definitive but there are, there are ways to go about resolving that disagreement. But if you have disagreements about uh, intellectual seemings, that seems much more difficult to, uh, to approach. And uh, it can be. It depends on the case. Uh, here's one that I think some of you would disagree about. Uh, right. uh, here's a proposition. It is possible for a single man to be both the, fa 
father and grandfather of the same child. That seems true to me. Uh, uh, but, you, you know, it, uh, but many people don't think that's true. And so they would disagree. It's not possible for a person a man to be both the father and grandfather of the same child. And what I do is I point out the relations that they're just not seeing. And as soon as they see those relations, I've done it with my students, like a light going on, then we come to an agreement. So uh, ways to get people to, where you have a disagreement about seeming, something seems true to me but doesn't seem true to you. Uh, you just, it depends on the particular case. Uh, you've just got to go through what you think they're missing, which might be an entailment uh, or some misunderstanding of the terms. Um, I guess there's no guarantee that you'll come to agreement, but mm -hmm. that's probably too much to ask of any, in, in any realm. Yeah, prob probably it's more difficult uh, if we are talking about uh, uh, proper duties rather than prima facie duties, although you might not consider that proper duties are the of themselves uh, intellectual seemings. Maybe it's only prima facie duties that are seemings and not... If you consider that proper duties are seemings, then it's much more hard it's much harder to uh, uh to bet on some resolution of uh of a disagreement insofar as uh different people can have widely different notions on what which uh prima facie duty is more important in one situation and this is something that probably cannot be, seems irreducible to me. Of course, uh, uh, how do you say, not always, but uh, that's, that's where uh, moral disagreement comes from. You know, mm. people put different weights on different principles and it's, it's, it's very difficult to resolve that issue in a way that is uh, universal or even uh, you know, to, to understand each other. Why, why do you consider that a loyalty to this promise is more important than not harming the person? It's uh, widely person dependent, more than maybe uh, perceptual uh, seemings. Um, but of course, maybe you don't think that duty, duty proper are the object of intellectual seemings, that it more prima facie duties that are, then it's, it's slightly different. Um, I don't have a problem with the idea of, I mean, this is a way in which I diverge from, from Ross, that, that certain uh, actions, particular actions could seem just plain wrong. You know, just think of Harmon's uh, watching the example of watching the thug, you see some thugs setting fire to a cat and torturing it to death. That just immediately strikes me yeah, as forcefully as wrong as any of Ross's prima facie duties. Uh, in part because it seems such a simple, morally simple case. Uh, there's no complexity there. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of, you know, something a bit controversial. Uh, over in Br England we've been arguing for a long time about whether we ought to stay in the EU or not. Mm -hmm. Hugely complicated. I mean, there's just no prospect of that seeming one answer or the other seeming true. And anybody who claims to know the answer to that, even yeah, whether it's liberal or illiberal, uh, I, that, that looks to me like uh, intellectual arrogance. Yeah, you might have a perfectly good argument for your case, but you don't know it. Mm. We'd, yeah, we've just got to wait and see. <laughs> we've made our decision now. We'll, pa uh, we'll see how things pan out. <laughs> oh, go on, carry on. Thanks so much, Marta. Marta is uh, one of, uh, is the second French uh, intuitionist probably I mean, next to me. So I'm, I'm super happy that Marta is with, uh, with us. Thank, thanks so much for your question. Uh, Madeleine, if you wanted to ask a question, please. Oh, so first, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And uh, my question is kind of a follow up to Marta's question. I also would like to know a little bit more about the analogy between perceptual and intellectual seemings. 
So uh, what I must admit firstly is that I have never been very persuaded by intuitionism. So let's just say that. Uh, but uh, I, I just want to ask what uh, what worries me is uh, what makes intellectual seemings reliable, because uh, uh, I, I can't really distinguish intellectual seemings from opinions. Uh, when you when you claim that they are like perceptual seemings in a way, uh, I'm interested in how would you answer a version of the lack of independent independent calibration argument. Like, for example, when you have a perceptual seeming and you want to know if it is reliable, you can always calibrate it to something else, to a rather different kind of justification. But with intuitions, it seems to be the case that you can't really calibrate them. So how would you answer such an argument? Uh, well, there are going to be various ways in which um, yeah, intellectual seemings are different from perceptual seemings. Um, so really I wasn't claiming that they're similar in all respects, but rather they're similar in certain important respects. Uh, and, way, and they capture ways in which they can explain things about intuitions. As I say, I, say, I think you can, that in certain intuitions have a certain recalcitrance. You can find yourself still having certain intuitions even though you don't believe them. And that fits very well with uh, the perceptual analogy. And it certainly militates against the idea that um, intuitions are a certain sort of belief because very few of us believe that P and believe that not P. Uh, well, and you certainly couldn't believe that P and not believe that P. <laughs> uh, so um, that fits with certain things. So I, I wouldn't claim, that, and also, yeah, in perception, you kind of, as I'm looking at my wall now, there's a whole load of other things I see as a kind of background. Uh, but, I, but propositions tend to get, they seem true in isolation. Uh, there's certain entailments involved in an adequate understanding of the relevant proposition. So there, there, there's neighboring propositions, so perhaps that's analogous. Uh, but it doesn't, so there's going to be ways in which they're not analogous. Uh, my point is that I'd like them to be as close as possible, uh, but what matters to me is that the, the important ways in which they're similar. And the really important one is the principle according to which some, uh, that something seeming to be a certain way, including seeming to be true, is evidence for it being that way. Uh, I think that's a perfectly good epistemic principle so long as we allow that certain things can completely undercut that uh, justification. So if the evolutionary theory is true, a uh, debunking argument is good, then the reason, you know, it seems to us that we reason not to harm others is just because believing that we ought not to, or we have reason not to harm others has survival value. It's nothing to do with truth. And that would undercut that seeming. And similarly in the perceptual case, if, if uh, I've taken a drug that makes blue walls seem green, then actually the fact it seems green is evidence that it's blue. <laughs> uh, and there's no justification for believing it's green at all in that situation. Uh, so uh, I think I've only answered a part of your question. There's a, a, a quite a few strands of it, but um, I'm getting a bit tired, I guess. So I kind of I forgot. I've gotten the other. Could you remind me some of the other strands? Uh, I thank you first. Thank you for the for the uh, for the first part of the question. I now I see the point more clearly. Uh, my idea was. Because we want for intuitions to have a justificatory force, and uh, when we want something to have a justificatory force, when we want it to, to justify our theory, and in the same time we claim that it's deeply unreliable and it, that it's deeply fallible, how do we face this challenge? How do we oh, okay. deal with this? Uh, well, you've got to look at the arguments for it being deeply unreliable and deeply fallible. I mean, Sinner Armstrong. Uh, utilizes various uh, findings in empirical psychology to show that intuitions are deeply unreliable. Um, so either they don't provide justification at all, or if they do, they only do so inferentially. And so either way, intuitionism is false. <laughs> uh, now, I think some of the steps in that are quite bad. Uh, I think 
I mean, I think the interesting thing about empirical psychology, I mean, first of all, you've got to be pretty sure they're talking about intuitions as we understand them and want to defend them. Um, and secondly, even if he's right, even if they are that unreliable, such that you've got to kind of run through various checks to see whether your intuitions are reliable, uh, can be trusted, that doesn't make the justification you get um, inferential. All it does is restore the original justification, which is non-inferential. Um, so we should check these things. I mean, some of these things we should check. Uh, and empirical psychology is a good um, source that needs to be sorted out. But it's just like, um, yeah, if you're on a promotions committee and you go on your un unconscious bias training, uh, and you say, well, how can you overcome unconscious bias in the, uh, the appointment procedure or in the promotion procedure? Well, do a bit of unconscious bias training and then try to make sure you take every step possible to avoid falling into the, the traps that we're so prone to fall into. And you could do the same with morality as well. Going your know, unconscious bias, moral philosophy training. <laughs> but you just, you need to be aware what the possible traps are and then just be on the lookout for those. But many moral intuitions, um, they're not, they're not uh, emotional, driven by emotion or passions. We I mean, take the example of the transitivity of, uh, of better than. I mean, that really doesn't do it for me. I don't get excited. Uh, fidelity to promises, I don't feel very emotional about that. I've, it's not clear to me I've got any immediate self-interest bound up with that. But yeah, you know, these are the sorts of questions you want to ask in your more reflective moments about whether the, the possible things that could distort your thinking uh, or your intuitions in ways that either undercut or outweigh them. You know, to tr you know, all we can do is do our best to try to ensure that those distorting factors aren't doing their work. And that's the best you can do, I think. Not a, it's not a tidy answer, but that that's what it's like in the real world, I think. Thanks so much, Ruth. Uh, Julia. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your talk, really. And um, I was uh, reflecting on the, the kind of rational ability that we need to apprehend self-evident self principles, according to Ross. And he speaks of uh, mental maturity and the ability to think in general terms. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, authors who develop uh, uh, accounts of moral perception and who develop, uh, so to say, a more Aristotelian approach to the disability to the ability, this ability to apprehend principles, which um, takes into account also an effective, an affective mature maturity, and uh, development on, of the character which is needed in order to grasp some principles. And I would like to ask you if, in your opinion, is there a want, a lack of this dimension in Ross, and it, if it would be prolific to explore this perspective, or uh, rather if it is not necessary because reflection is uh, enough, and if speaking on if intellectual seemings seems to go in this direction, so that reflection is enough. And thank you very much again. Uh, well, thanks for that, and uh, it's great to meet you, uh, almost in person. <laughs> um, I think there's two issues here. So, well, one is seeing the truth of some proposition, and the other is it's having some sort of purchase on you. Um, one of the very, I mean, the, I mean, the government, for a long time, we'd, you know, here's a kind of non-moral example. For a long time, we've known that kind of uh, smoking means you've got a high risk of dying a rather unpleasant death from lung cancer. But many smokers knew that, it just didn't have any grip on them. Uh, it just seemed a bit of an abstract fact. Um, and so the government very sensibly, uh, their policy to try to hammer home this message is like literally interview pe people who are dying of lung cancer in their final weeks and just making it very vivid. And that's really kind of engaging, not just this this abstract knowledge of, oh yeah, I know, I know I'm taking a, a bad, you know, serious risk in smoking, but just showing the full horror of what, what might happen if, this, if you're unlucky. Um, and that works, that kind of, so they have, 
it's one thing to have a kind of abstract knowledge, which you can get, I think, from reflection and seemings. Um, and you might need something more to really engage you know, the motivations and so on, uh, to really get you to appreciate the force of some of these convictions. Uh, yes. So you would distinguish the two scopes, that's, so to say, the, the, know, the knowing and the motivating. Would... Yeah, I wouldn't want to distinguish those too strongly, but um, I do think there's a difference between kind of seeing some truth, some practical truth in a rather abstract way, where it kind of, it kind of has some of motivation, but it doesn't really mo you know, have the sort of force it really should have on you. And then getting you to appreciate it in a more concrete way. Uh, and, and that really, you know, that does the job. That might be the thing that gets you to give up whatever vices you have um, even though you knew in you knew had no doubt that these are very bad for you just uh, it just didn't matter that much so okay. uh, thanks so much we have two more Thank questions you. and not that much time so I'll just uh, first I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read myself a question by a French student Louis who comes from the University of Nanterre and he asks you uh, very straightforward question. What about metaphysics? Uh, can we talk about a moral intuition without a metaphysical perspective? Because an intuition is something that is in you. So how can you explain having an intuition without referring to a metaphysical principle? We could answer that objection by saying that we can use our personal experience, but then it should not be called intuition, but empirical evidence, in my opinion. And I think that this is a very nice question because this is something, this is exactly where French students next year are going to struggle, right? So great, if you could help us with this. Okay. Uh, there's a sense in which intuitions are in you and a sense in which they're not. Because uh, the term intuition can mean either the attitude you have towards some proposition, and that's a mental state, that's in the head, so to speak. Then there's the thing intuited, which is a proposition, and I don't think they're in us. Uh, and so you, uh, and that's no more mysterious than, you know, beliefs. Beliefs are in the head. The attitude of believing something's in the head, but the thing believed isn't in the head. Um, when I have beliefs about the wall, in the color of the wall, the boring beliefs that philosophers have, uh, that's not a belief about something in my head, although the belief is in the head. Um, so do you need a metaphysics? What I was kind of hoping to, to do without too, and this, this might be overly optimistic, too extravagant in metaphysics. Uh, I mean, Robert Audi recently has really put some quite complex metaphysics uh, together with his epistemology to, to ground the idea that an understanding could justify belief. So he's kind of bought into the whole idea that an adequate understanding of a proposition puts you in touch with abstract objects and their relations. And since those objects and the relations are the truth maker of the proposition, your understanding can justify your uh, belief of the same content because an adequate understanding puts you in direct contact with the truth makers. Uh, I've got a kind of simpler and more kind of naive view, uh, which is just uh, the principle I've already mentioned a couple of times, which is phenomenal conservatism, which is just that that something seems to be a certain way is evidence that it is that way. That's the simplest explanation of why it seems to be that way. And of course it can be defeated and undercut, but it does provide default justification. Um, and that doesn't seem to me to commit you to any very complex uh, metaphysics. Might be I need some, uh, I think I am, I do think I'm not a complete quietist on the metaphysics front. I think the truth makers of moral propositions uh, are instances of properties in the world. Uh, but that's a separate point. I don't think that, um, as I say, I th think that all that does the epistemic work is something seeming to be a certain way and it's seeming being evidence for truth. So I don't think that part of my view commits me to anything very robust. Just all I need is my ability to understand certain propositions, to make certain inferences from them that are bound up with understanding them. Uh, 
and an ability to certain things to become to seem true once I adequately understand them. I totally think that we need an in any case, I mean, I don't think there's anything special about. Sorry. Uh, okay. Can you, have you lost the? Can you hear me now? It's good now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't know how much of that lost. I kind of. Well, ju just one phrase, actually. It's. it's oh, okay. Yeah. I think I was probably waffling anyway. You probably got the gist of what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so th thanks so, far, so much for this. I was just saying anyway, does we really need, I think that, you know, in another lecture, maybe shared lecture with one or two other people about what we, what several different people m mean by the notion of intuition would be necessary because I really think that, you know, what the way you are using it is so different from the way that experimental philosophy is using it. It's just very different. Uh, so, um, and we, we also have to have in mind what, how historically it has been used, right? There, there was a faculty, there was, there was this idea of, you know, so, so I think that th this should be discussed um, again. So I think we are not over yet. So be careful. Yeah, no, that'd be fascinating. Um, okay, so the last question, please. And we are going to... Um, so, uh, sort of, uh, sort of, sorry, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, that's fine. I, I got the hint. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, wasn't the dismissal of intuitions as a data a little too quick? Uh, because uh, it is possible to take that as data. I mean, uh, for sure, Rawls, you know, in reflective equilibrium talks of considered moral judgments, which is the data which is input to the, again, whole process. And Boyd, too, talks about observations, wherein he says observations could be observations about yourself, your own mental states. So therefore, uh, couldn't we go ahead with, uh, you know, these moral convictions of educated people? I'm not really making a difference there, but these convictions to be the basis, and then you provide some kind of justification through some process. Um, well, not, not unless there's something better. <laughs> or not if there's something better, I mean. Uh, I mean, presumably, if those moral uh, those moral convictions have a justification, uh, and if they're justified, surely whatever justifies them, this is the point I tried to make in the lecture, whatever justifies them is more fundamental than the mere fact that those people have those just uh, moral convictions. So if they're justified, surely what justifies them is more basic and is so uh, the proper sort of data of ethics than the mere fact that they had the those convictions in the first place. Right. Uh, so, could, yeah. So, could I just ask you about uh, a coherentist kind of justification? Uh, what What would be then the data in in that context? Uh, well, this is not a coherentist view. Uh, so that, um, yeah, it might be right. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it could be you know, perhaps if you were a, a coherentist, uh, yeah, the data would be just you know, a bundle of moral convictions and how they uh, cohere, and, and which would be the most coherent kind of combination. But I just don't, unless there's a link to the, I mean, the best actually, I mean, if you look, look at Scandon, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a reflective equilibrium person. Um, mm -hmm and claims to be rejecting uh, an intuitionist epistemology. But if you look at what he says about his method, it starts off not with just any old convictions, but those that are independently credible, i.e. the ones that seem true. I mm. thought, hang on a minute, you just started off with intuitions as I understand them. So the starting point is those intuitions. And at that, it may, if you understand those intuitions, the difference between uh, somebody like Scanlon myself is really quite small. Uh, it's really how we just describe ourselves. Because I think the sort of reflection that Scanlon goes through, which he calls reflective equilibrium, is a perfectly legitimate way of making sure our intuitions are reliable, which ones are reliable and which ones have to be rejected. Because there's no guarantee that all your intuitions are going to kind of cohere. Uh, and if they don't cohere, that gives you reason to abandon at least some of them. Right. And then you've got to figure out which ones do I abandon. Well, 
going to have to think some more about that and just go through the reflect equilibrium. So I don't think there's a hard and fast distinction between yeah, reflective equilibrium and intuitionism. This is what Hare thought about rules in that rather rude review he wrote of Rawls' book, except he saw that as uh, you know, a problem with Rawls' theory. I don't see it as a problem. I just see it as a kind of development of an intuition, or it can be regarded as a development of an intuitionist yeah. view uh, yeah. anyway. And that, that's one of the things that, yeah, that's not new to me. I mean, Robert Audi uh, mm -hmm. made similar points when he first started writing about this sort of thing. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Philippe. I hope that, you know, this is just the beginning of this conversation. And so I hope that, you know, the French students who are going to listen to this, to this lecture are going to enjoy it as much as we did. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And thanks for everybody for taking time out to, to listen and take part. It's really appreciated.